Hello everyone, I'm Tomasz Gruszkowski from the National Library of Poland and I welcome you to an open webinar of EFLA PAC. The webinar is on digitization in general, but on digital preservation in particular. Welcome to the webinar with Trevor Owens. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, I guess that uh, Everyone uh, knows, at least knows of Trevor Owens, and uh, I hope that his presentation today will make you want uh, more of him. And uh, well, he's uh, available at different places and in different forms, uh, including a few books and uh, quite a few uh, recordings of his uh, talks. So uh, this is uh, the next one. Uh, Trevor, over to you. Please tell us about uh, digital preservation. Sure, I I'm hope. happy to. Um, and so I will share screen here. Um, and there we go, view. Let's do slideshow from the beginning. Okay, great. And so it looks like you should just be seeing the one slide and I've got presenter view up on, on my side. So I'm uh, thrilled to have this chance to talk with all of you today about digital preservation. Um, uh, I'm the, for a little more context, I work at the, the US Library of Congress. Um, I'm also teach at um, Digital History at American University and um, uh, digital preservation courses for the University of Maryland's high school. Um, and so my talk today about ensuring enduring digital access principles and approaches to digital preservation will be a kind of overview of issues in digital preservation and then uh, spend a lot of the time today talking about um, uh, some sort of core principles, um, some of which may be counterintuitive for working with digital preservation. So. As a way of starting, um, uh, all of us, I think, get hit with two very different stories about what's going on with digital information. Um, so every so often you see something like this come up, which is from Inc. Magazine um, online. What we post online is forever and we need a reminder. Um, this is the sort of one kind of digital anxiety we face, which is that uh, all kinds of digital information might just persist online forever. I did, in many cases, this is the kind of thing that gets told to young people to, to make them be more cautious about what they're doing. Um, but we've got one anxiety about things sticking around forever. And then at the same time, we have the opposite anxiety, which is uh, that a digital arc dark age may be coming around the corner at any moment. We might catastrophically lose all kinds of really important digital information. Um, that anxiety, that they're both significantly true in certain ways, right? There is information that can persist online about our worlds and our experiences that uh, we can't control. And at the same time, um, there are genuine and real threats to potential catastrophic data loss. Um, but the good news is, is that we've now we have you know, half a century of work of librarians, archivists, museum curators, um, folklorists, uh, historians, et cetera, um, focused on how to do digital preservation. And uh, my last book, The Theory and Craft of Digital Preservation, is really an attempt to draw out and sort of map out a lot of that uh, background and, and context for, for folks working within libraries, archives, and museums, but also um, more broadly to any number of, of areas that people interested in digital preservation, enduring access to digital information might look. And so for context to anyone who's interested, the, the there's an open access version of the book, the preprint, right? So the, the version I sent to the publisher before it went through all the editing, that's just up online for free to read. So uh, you can go check that out now or at any point. Um, and I'll give a little bit of the tour of the book before I jump into the talk, which really is gonna focus on um, 
some sort of core principles. Um, so the points I was just discussing around kind of the digital hype and digital anxiety are the jumping off point for the book. Then um, in the first chapter, I really focus on uh, untangling the various lineages of preservation that come together as a context for understanding digital preservation. And I think an important point for this is that when we talk about preservation, we're often talking about different things, um, that there's a whole history of, say, art conservation, or archaeological work related to preservation, that oral history is a whole area of activity around documentation. Um, we have things like preservation reformatting and microfilming. Um, we have, you know, various kind of even monastic or scribal traditions of copying. Um, we have, uh, you know, kind of modern uh, library management work that has to do with, um, you know, focusing on environmental conditions for storage. All of those come together in context when we're talking about preservation. Um, and because there's such a huge context collapse with digital information, all those lineages sort of pool together into one thing. And so when we talk about digital preservation, we're sort of simultaneously talking across all of those traditions. Um, I then spent some time focusing on how to understand digital objects, aspects of digital objects um, for the ground up sort of bit level all the way up to compound complex digital objects, how things get rendered, those sorts of points. And then the rest of the book builds out from an idea that digital preservation is a craft instead of being um, sort of a technical um, sort of problem to be solved. And so from that, focusing on collection development, preservation intent, uh, looking at how to manage copies and formats, delving into issues around arranging and describing materials, um, and then focusing on how things get accessed and used. So that is an overview of the book. But I'll switch now to an overview of uh, the rest of this talk. So in, in the next few slides, I'll try and draw out a short definition of digital preservation. And that's partly to contrast with some, I think, tacit assumptions that often come up around issues with digital preservation. Um, and from there, I'll jump into uh, the, what I call 16 axioms for digital preservation. They're, the high level principles they they form the the bulk of the first chapter of the book and are um in many ways the kind of uh they're sort of the opening to the set of issues that, that i get into in the book but then also in many ways they're kind of a, a summary or conclusion of sort of key takeaways so i found that they tend to be the most useful thing to present um from the book and then i will uh, spend a little bit of time talking about a short list of steps and resources that people around the world can use to improve uh, digital preservation. So for starters, let's talk about what is and isn't digital preservation. Um, and if you're unfamiliar, you may not, you may or may not have seen this diagram. This is the full sort of complex OAS diagram showing everything from ingest to administration to data management, the relationships between them. This is a more simplified, but still rather complex model for the OAS, the Arch Open Archives um, standard. Um, and it's all of this is full of really great and useful information. These are important things to understand. Um, the relationship between planning and administration and systems, but it's also been the case that um, in many contexts, this approach to thinking about packages of data functioning across these systems, um, this has been thought of almost as a technical diagram for a system to kind of solve digital preservation. But in practice, um, that has tended to not work out so well. So uh, a lot of what we'll get into in the principles that I'm going to share um, sort of demonstrates the way that um, many of the core ideas involved in this sort of technical diagram approach thinking about digital preservation um, are still true. It's just some of the assumptions that come with sort of looking at this and thinking about it as a system um, don't hold up or, or work well in the context of what we know from 
you know, that 50 years of, of practice. So the working definition that I'll go with here is that digital preservation is working to ensure enduring access to digital content. And in this context, the idea is that anything and everything that's required to ensure enduring access to digital content is actually a part of digital preservation. So that means the salaries that get paid to staff who tend the systems. It means the um, the resources that need to go into you know an IT infrastructure. It means the work that goes into planning and coordinating um, with the whole uh, you know everything related to making sure materials actually discoverable and usable. All of these are under the auspices of digital preservation. We take this comprehensive kind of definition into into account. So with that. We'll then move into these axioms um, and talk through them and uh, I'll go one at a time through them and sort of describe some of the key points. Um, and then we'll likely have a, a good bit amount of or a good bit of time for any and all questions that come up. Um, but we'll dive right in. So the first one is that a repository is not a piece of software. So Software systems themselves can't actually do preservation. Um, they aren't repositories under themselves. The repository in those cases is really the sum of the financial resources, the hardware, the staff time, the ongoing implementation of policy and planning, you know, everything involved in long-term access. And an important nuance here too is that any software system that you're gonna use to provide access to digital content will by necessity be temporary. We will replace it um, with something else in the future. And so in, in this context, the work of digital preservation is really primarily about maintaining continuity and functions over time through varied systems. Um, so the important element there is that you don't procure a system that then does all of this and you're done. You're sort of, we live in a uh, world where we're continually needing to manage risk and, and work through migrations of systems and software to do the work. And the systems and software aren't the sole objects that are or resources that enable digital preservation. And the second one is that institutions are the, the mechanisms that actually make preservation possible. And so without care and management, all the things that matter to us really won't persist into the the future. Um, it's we with analog materials, it was possible to sort of through benign neglect leave, say, a diary in an attic for a century, and then it could be discovered by someone and read through. Um, but in the situation we're in now, if if someone finds a hundred year old hard drive or floppy disk, um, the likelihood that data could be recovered off that is very, very low. The mediums are not durable. Um, so the primarily primary enablers of preservation are, are our institutions, the sort of systems that we put together, whether they're libraries, archives, museums, but even more broadly, families and religious organizations, governments, et cetera. Um, and those institutions are able to set up systems and functions to ensure enduring access. So from that, you know, the org charts from those institutions, their hiring practices, their funding, their credibility, they all become part of the machinery that makes preservation possible. Um, the third one here is that tools can get in the way just as much as they can help. Um, there are a lot of specialized digital preservation tools and software, um, and they can be tremendously useful, particularly if you're working with a lot of data at scale. But in many cases, they're, the best thing to do is start small, um, you know, identify what the files are you need to ensure access to in the future, um, set up processes and approaches to checking and replicating those files. Um, and the more complexity you introduce in us in the systems you're working with um, will also bring with it potential risks related to um, the ability to you know manage the complexity of those systems. Uh, ultimately, as we were, I was just describing earlier, 
we're looking at being able to get our data into something and get it out of something in the future. Um, and so it's really important to have that be as sort of elegant and clean as possible in, uh, in whatever approaches we set up for digital preservation. The fourth one is that uh, nothing has been preserved. There are only things being preserved. So this is underscoring that preservation is an ongoing set activity. It's not a one and done thing. The work isn't ever finished. And that has really big ramifications for how we think about staffing and resourcing this work. Uh, if we want, uh, if you really want to evaluate how serious an organization is about digital preservation, you know, we don't need to look at the their code or their storage systems. Um, we really want to start talking about the finance side of this, right? What resources are actively being invested in the work that is the ongoing nature of, of doing preservation? The fifth one is that hoarding is not preservation. So it is actually very easy to just hoover up all kinds of digital materials and start replicating copies of them. But in keeping with what we know about sort of the good practice of doing library and archives management, simply having copies is not enough to constitute preservation. The material needs to be discoverable and accessible. Um, you need a clear and coherent approach to collection development, arrangement, description. And beyond that, there's a huge host of ethical issues or questions about what kinds of information should be stored and kept, potentially sensitive information, or restricted information um, uh, and just hoovering up large amounts of data um, in this kind of hoarding sense can get you into all kinds of problems and issues. So that first point um, there that hoarding is not preservation and related that um, backing up data is also uh, not digital preservation. So, uh, it can be related to it, right? So the idea that you, you know, an IT staff might back up all the files on a uh, daily or weekly basis, right? Um, and be able to recover you back to the setup you were in. Um, but that's not the same as everything that's required to, you know, a hundred years from now, be able to access the content of that digital material. And so this one ends up being, usually useful for delving into um, some of the big picture issues that come up in talking with IT organizations about digital preservation work. That there's um, sort of disaster recovery, momentary restores of data and systems is very different than um, you know, ensuring that enduring access to digital content. So number seven, is that the boundaries of digital objects are fuzzy, which again, this seems somewhat counterintuitive. We think of digital technology as being very precise and, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of clean and comprehensive. But interestingly, um, individual digital objects reference and incorporate aspects of other objects or files sort of constantly in their function. So you may, have a piece of software that you're keeping a copy of, but when, if you were to run its installer, it might call a number of web services to download files to actually make it work. Um, or similarly, you know, fonts, video codecs, um, any number of things like that. Or, you know, if you load up an archived copy of a web page, whether or not the embedded videos were captured or not is an important question. Um, I think, you know, we, Everyone's likely familiar with tweets and Twitter, but if you're looking at, for instance, a tweet as a, a an object, as actual a JSON file that is the Twitter um, data format, um, there's no images embedded in them, right? They're references to URLs that live in different locations. And so while you might see and think of that tweet as having an image in it, it's actually an object that calls another service that renders the image. So those kinds of those fuzzy boundaries become important for delineating the sort of start and end of what really matters about a set of digital objects that you need to keep and manage. Um, a really practical example of this, uh, we've done some, we've done some analysis on old PowerPoint files archived from government websites in the United States. And 
in many cases, those files, um, you start to play them, but it becomes clear that there's videos that were linked to and embedded in the uh, PowerPoint. Um, and so when those videos went offline, you know, a decade ago or something like that, the, the content of that file no longer has them included in it. So you can't really see the presentation as it looked, even though you have the file because it was calling on that third party service. Um, Number eight is that one person's digital collection is another's digital object is another's data set. And so this is a point that uh, there's a lot of ways to think about different parts of digital objects. Um, and it builds on that fuzziness point from before, but that you know someone may want to uh, read and render a digitized book. Someone else may want to uh, compute and run algorithms against the text of a corpus of digitized books. So it might be a data set to them. Um, but it is th the center of this is that it's really important for anyone working with digital materials to define the terms on which they're organizing and collecting that material and the intention for how it's to be used. Um, because you may have slippages between these sort of ways to think about items, objects, collections, things as data, et cetera. The ninth point is that uh, digital preservation is about making use of resources to mitigate threats and risks. So there's no sort of end to the work of digital preservation. Um, and that might be, that's both, I think hopefully empowering and a little scary that, um, I think it's a lot better to think about digital preservation in the way that we think about, say, cybersecurity than um, where you know we need to model risks and threats and think about what the most pressing issues are that could result in loss of content. Um, a good example I'll bring up here is uh, I was at a conference with, early before working on the book, I was at a conference um, with, uh, getting coffee with someone who worked at a house museum, talking with them about digital preservation. So an organization that has, you know, one or two staff and um, they were really interested in learning more about digital preservation that we're going to pay to go to a workshop soon to spend a couple of days learning more about um, premise, a sophisticated um, schema for recording preservation actions. And um, in talking with them, I was, I was trying to feel out what the biggest risks they were facing were. And the thing they brought up was that they had this set of oral history interviews that were video files. Um, they were all basically on one, you know, computer terminal in their office. Um, so, you know, this whole set of material is basically one spilt cup of coffee away from being, you know, lost, right? There's only one copy of it on one computer, um, you know, on a, a pretty cheap, just hard drive that you get with the default computer. Um, and so in talking with them more, and I think this is a principle for all of us to take into account, if we take this risk mindset, it's important to think about first and foremost, get a second copy of that material, right? Ideally, make sure it's not co-located. It might even be uploaded into, you know, cloud storage, or it could be a hard drive that you take home with you. Um, but that um, risk mitigation framework helps, I think, steer people towards the kind of get the boxes off of floor activities of digital preservation instead of getting into the um, a lot of the more bigger and still important sort of broader theoretical issues. But that um, when we work from that risk mitigation approach, there's very tangible and specific uh, ways to respond to the most pressing risks of data loss, which tend to be not having enough copies, not having them inventoried, that kind of thing. Uh, number 10 is that the answer to nearly all digital preservation questions is it depends. Um, and so this relates in a lot of ways to the notion of digital preservation as craft, that um, there are a lot of issues that come, if you're working with huge amounts of data, you may need to think about very different kinds of storage systems than you would with much smaller amounts of data. If you're working with very large files, say AV material, you have different approaches than if you're working with, say, very small files like uh, you know, documents or PDFs. If you're in a situation where 
um, you have control over what format someone submits material to you to, then you can be in a very different sort of set of situations than something where you have to take, you know, whatever comes in with this manuscript collection. Um, that a lot of the, the context is really important for making those decisions. Um, and uh, that's sort of central to the idea of digital preservation as craft. 11 is that it's long time past to start taking actions. Um, so it is still possible to spend a lot of time thinking about sort of the, the frontiers of issues, things like virtualization and emulation or things like, um, you know, complex data models and schemas for preservation actions. But um, it's only worthwhile to, to get into those things if you've if you and your organization have gotten into the very practical and pragmatic sets of issues around um, mitigating the most pressing risks for loss. Um, so it's uh, really important to be prioritizing those kinds of actions. Um, and that relates to the 12th one, which is that very technical definitions of digital preservation uh, have been in some ways complicit in, in silencing the past that, um, a lot of the, the complicated work around the kind of highly technical framing of digital preservation um, in discussions with a lot of people at smaller organizations has really made it seem to them like digital preservation just isn't something they, they could tackle or accomplish. Um, and that really obfuscates the very practical things that we can all do to sort of make copies, manage copies, that kind of thing. Um, then 13 is that uh, the affordances of digital media prompt a need for preservation to be entangled with digital collection development. So uh, the main idea here is that digital media gives us very different and new opportunities for engaging with communities that we, um, we have. There's all kinds of new creative works people are producing in digital formats. Um, and it's increasingly important not just to look at what we can do with the digital materials we may have today, but to be going back and looking at our organization's missions and goals and thinking about what kinds of new digital content is being produced that would relate to that mission and those goals um, so that there's new kinds of things to collect and preserve. And it's important to get into that. One of the most practical areas this tends to be the case for is um, at this point, web archiving is a really robust um, set of tools and workflows. Um, and in almost any area that organizations work in and have collected in the past, much of that content is now available online. So getting into spaces to think through how to resource and support that kind of work um, becomes really important. So the 14th point is that uh, we should remember to accept and embrace the archival sliver. So the idea there is that uh, we haven't ever saved everything in the past. Uh, it's actually, we haven't saved most things. We really have a sliver that comes to us from you know, our distant past and even our recent past of all of the information that's been produced. Um, going back to those points about digital hype and hyperbole, um, sometimes it becomes uh, the sort of ideology around digital information makes it seem like we could or maybe should try to save everything that we could fundamentally do our work in different ways. But when we accept and respond to the fact that the work necessary to organize, to describe, to sort of ethically um, sort of make sure we're, we're processing out the right information from large sets of data, all of that sort of social functions and ethical ones around those do require significant amounts of time and effort. And so it will continue to be important to be uh, selective, but it's a little different too, as I point out with the 15th one, which is that the scale and inherent structures of digital information do suggest that it's, it's better to work with a shovel than a tweezers. Um, and so the shovel tweezers metaphor there goes back to, um, uh, the more product, less process approach to archival processing with the idea that um, uh, it's often more important to sort of work at scale with digital information. This is something that was true for, for any number of analog archives too, but that um, 
while we are needing to embrace that we can't collect and preserve everything, it's also possible now to, to take sort of large sets of material um, and make decisions about it in aggregate, uh, particularly because digital content and information tends to come with large amounts of um, embedded technical metadata, file names, um, dates created, all sorts of information like that that can be very useful for enabling search and discovery, um, full text, et cetera, um, the ability to automate identification of file formats, those sorts of things, um, that we do have a lot of ways that we can sort of scale up our work by using these, um, uh, using the inherent structure and, and nature of digital information to support us, but that we do still need to be sort of selective within that framework. And then the 16th one, and the last one, so thank you everyone for being patient through a long journey through 16 different principles, is that doing digital preservation requires us to think like a futurist. Um, if we're thinking about access to digital information 100 years from now, uh, we need to be thinking about the what interfaces to systems might look like, what um, uh, what ways we might access and use information in the future. And um, it's really hard and unpredictable, right? That uh, even in you know the last decade or two, we've seen a huge transition away from say keyboards to um, mobile devices that are sort of the primary interfaces. And we're seeing another huge shift into voice as a way of accessing and interfacing to computing environments. So uh, we'll be thinking about what that means for access to the materials we're gathering and acquiring now. But at the same time, we do know that you know people are going to need to render and access PDF files for a very long time. So whatever kind of virtual future computing environments exist, we can have some confidence there'll be documents like there have been. Um, and this huge preponderance of media that has been produced is going to need to be usable and viable in the future. So um, staying in tune with those trends is important and uh, understanding where, where those shifts are coming from is broadly important for us in the field. So that's a tour of that set of axioms. And I'm gonna wrap, round out this talk with a little discussion of some very practical and pragmatic things that any and everyone can do um, to start today to improve our practices around digital preservation. So here's a list of six things that are kind of the most basic building blocks, whether for individual people or for families or for, um, you know, cultural heritage institutions of any shape or size. So the, the first and most important thing is the work to identify what digital stuff you have that you really need to make sure you can keep into the future. Um, and that second point is to start doing the work to get sort of those digital boxes metaphor off the floor. So uh, pragmatically, proactively working through risks um, as a way to do that. And then the third point that you, uh, this is not a one-time activity that you need a schedule and a plan for how you're going to check in and improve things over time. Um, it's very easy to make sort of making a digital preservation policy or plan, something that happens once, but isn't returned to, um, but that isn't at all in keeping with what we know we need to be doing if, if digital preservation is important to us or our organizations. Um, so if you're looking for resources to use to help to get those digital boxes off the floor, a fourth point is to read the NDSA levels of digital preservation paper, which I will show a picture of on the next slide. And with that, that the National Digital Stewardship Alliance, the Digital Preservation Consortium, um, or coalition, um, Digital Library Federation, there are other groups within IFLA as well, all kinds of groups where you can join the community of practice, where you can learn more about the craft and practice of digital preservation. And the last one I'd offer is that um, you can go read the preprint of my book, The Theory and Craft of Digital Preservation. And so here again is the levels of digital preservation, which is this tiered set of guidance for working through each of those areas of that things like storage, file fixity, data integrity, kind of looking at how to level up practice over time. So that's a resource I'd refer you to. And, and here's once again, a picture of uh, the book as a, a resource you can use. And so with that, I think we're at a point where 
Um, we can switch to taking questions and talk through questions for as long or as many as there are. Yes, yes, I'm not mute anymore, and I am also visible, I guess. Okay. Guests. That's uh, your turn, I guess. And I'll, uh, at the moment, uh, my assistants and me will thank uh, Trevor. And, uh, okay, we'll give them, uh, okay, the, Trevor, you see the yeah, question? Yeah, I see the question. Thank so, you, Alenka. So the question there, um, many organizations believe that by making copies and backups, only can they save digital content. There was also a program called Locks. What do you think about it? Um, sure, so um, uh, Locks is still a great software platform that is being used by a number of organizations as a way to sort of redundantly manage copies of content between different organizations or institutions. Um, so I think it's, it's a good one. Um, to that, you know, a number of organizations are still using. Um, and on the the point there about, the point about what organizations think is or isn't necessary for digital preservation is, is a good one. There's um, the Digital Preservation Coalition has produced some short guides about um, sort of explaining digital preservations to executives in organizations. Um, and so those are a great resource to look to um, as ways to kind of explain the issues and complexity. The, the NDSA levels tend to be a useful resource too, because it's a way to sort of say, oh, okay, we do have, you know, replication of storage, that's great. But have we thought through, you know, issues about who has access to all of that storage? Or have we thought through, um, you know, are we doing routine checks of data um, in ways that are useful, those kinds of things. And so um, I think, uh, both those DPC resources and the NDSA levels can be really good resources for helping sort of educate and talk through the issues. Um, that's a great question, thank you. Um, my question is a very open one, I guess. Uh, do you see a possibility that uh, digital preservation becomes uh, um, better understood by the policymakers? I understand that uh, large organization like uh, the Library of Congress or big organization like the National Library of Poland uh, have the weight and strength to uh, see and to perform digital preservation as a process. Uh, what uh, chance do you see to uh, convince the, all the levels of uh, policymakers, politicians, people deciding on budgets? Uh, yeah, no, it's a great question. I think it's... Um... I think sort of advocacy and education in, in different levels of organizations is important to, to help this. I, I will say that um, uh, if you delve into the NDSA levels in a big way and look at what kinds of activities can check a lot of boxes in there, I think going back to that sort of house museum example I was sharing where you might have a place that has one or two staff, even just making copies of important information and putting them into, you know, uh, Dropbox or Google Drive or, um, you know, buying a hard drive and saving extra copies of them and updating it, you know, once a quarter or something like that really can dramatically reduce the risks that exist for um, digital, for loss of information. So I think there are a lot of very practical um, ways to do that um, that are not particularly expensive um, for smaller organizations. Um, but I think another aspect with this is um, it's really important for anyone working with digital preservation in any context to be able to explain the 
why it would what what would happen if this data was lost that that kind of explanation and being able to make that case to whatever the funders or stakeholders are for an organization is important um and i think one of the things that comes up with that too is that is really determining what piece of that sliver really matters for your organization or your constituency to focus on because um all of it can become very overwhelming but you know um if you're in an organization where your records management function is handled by a different part of the organization, then you can just focus on, you know, digital content you're acquiring or um, in a lot of other cases, you know, an organization that's getting, say, licensed ebooks or e-journals. Um, there are already sort of preservation agreements in place for enduring access to that material. You can really focus your resources most directly on um the the most important sort of local material that only your organization would tackle and work with which is i think another reason why sort of collaborative efforts are really important and even just um kind of organizations declaring and sharing what what works they're committed to preserving um on behalf of the broader community so that everyone doesn't need to try and do all of it on their own okay i was just saying uh thank you yeah Collaboration is uh, really important, and uh, if there is there is a question coming up, but it's not there yet, so I'll just uh, be first or third. Uh, cooperation between institutions, but uh, in your book you did write also about uh, using the users are um, crowdsourcing yeah stuff like that can you please elaborate on maybe uh, some examples or sure so um uh there are some really interesting uh a number of organizations say around web archiving have done things where they'll actually engage with their stakeholder communities to suggest sites you might collect or things like that. So I think there's interesting ways around sort of crowdsourcing, um, getting input on what to collect. Um, I think that sort of user feedback can be really useful. Um, but then another sort of big growing area of activity with crowdsourcing work has tended to be things like um, transcription or different kinds of activities that uh, people can volunteer to engage in to enhance the discoverability and accessibility of collections. Um, and those end up being, I think, also really interesting to look at for ways to sort of broaden your stakeholder community. The people who will advocate for our organizations are, you know, in many cases, people who build those stronger connections. So those kinds of virtual volunteering activities can be really great to expand and broaden constituencies for cultural heritage works. Connie, so we got another question there. Um, sure, so communities, resources, and um, as for starting from scratch to build a digital archive, digital preservation plan. Um, so the, the biggest one I would point to is um, that NDSA levels of digital preservation thing I was just describing. They have made some more recent resources. They actually have a sort of template and worksheet you can use to evaluate where you're at, which is a really helpful planning tool. Um, so that's one that I'd suggest. Um, and then as I'd noted to the, the DPC things, which um, Damas has already shared some links to, um, tends to have a lot of great resources there. Um, uh, and I think in that case, um, the best bet is often to start really simple and think about you know inventorying, identifying materials that are really important, getting copies of those and working with even just sort of very basic um, commodity IT things. And if you're sort of graduating out from that, then there are a range of platforms and services that um, you can buy into for um, uh, sort of basic tools and, and resources for organizing and managing digital libraries. And uh, at this point, most 
Um, there are sort of custom systems and tools like Preservica has a platform, um, uh, a locks platform that was brought up earlier. Um, but then at this point too, most digital library systems and services also have sort of file storage and management components that can start to work to, to, to connect with a lot of those requirements for digital preservation. Okay, my mind is uh, a bit split between uh, uh, listening and uh, yeah. putting some links in the chat, so uh, forgive me. Um, but uh, yeah, there should be some more. Maybe uh, you could prepare uh, a few links you recommend and uh, send sure. them over. And the recording of this uh, meeting will be put online. I'll uh, come up with the link to that too. And we can add uh, in the description of the video those uh, links that you give us. I'd be happy to. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, wait for a second for another. Uh, question from the audience. Uh, yeah, well, and we can we can always we can always end early too. There's no whatever mm -hmm. whatever works best for everyone. Uh, sure. So, um, what do I see in as the future of digital preservation and future challenges? So, I think um, I think the biggest challenges that we're likely facing, which are true of digital preservation and the true broadly of of work and cultural heritage um biggest challenges i think we're facing are um related to climate change and the, the range of issues that that is bringing about sort of social political issues um so you know there's um within the united states there's been uh a lot of great thinking and work on this and a group called archivists respond to climate change um but similarly the the U.S. National Park Service and a number of other organizations have focused on looking at, you know, the, which organizations are most at risk um, of, you know, um, increased risks from more sort of climate threat disasters and similarly um, just sea level rise where that will affect cultural heritage institutions and sort of society more broadly. Um, and so... I think in that context, um, one of the things that's really great about digital preservation is it's very, um, it's much easier to produce redundancy in digital information than it is with analog information. So it's possible to have, you know, things both accessible at a wide range of places and backed up in a number of them. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the challenges that we'll face around resources and around um, sort of just uh, stability for organizations in you know, the next 50 to 100 years are significant. Um, and so I think in a lot of ways, it's not necessarily um, particularly technical things that I think are gonna be the biggest challenges for us in the future, but the sort of social organizational sets of issues that'll come up around how to navigate um, challenges presented by climate change. Okay. Um, yes, I'm. I'm there. Uh, you have mentioned uh, redundancy, and I just wanted to uh, show some dangers of redundancy, uh, namely my uh, uh, assistant is. Uh, very popular. Uh, that's just an uh, image, uh, uh, Google images search. And you can see so many different uh, visions of that. Uh, some of them are uh, commercial and some of them are put up by some uh, overzealous individuals who take pictures in the museums or find some copies somewhere and what's uh, 
problem for me is that the institution at which the picture, the painting is uh, located is not, uh, as far as I see, in any of those uh, search results. So there is a, uh, I guess you can see it now, the uh, sole uh, picture of uh, the lady with an ermine. But uh, the Cultural Heritage Institution did not uh, work with Google or use the Google possibility, Google's possibilities to uh, let people find the picture in good quality. Uh, so uh, I guess this, uh, oops, I want to stop sharing. That's one of the yeah, dangers. and yeah, I think it's an interesting example too, where um, Google's not in the business of getting people to the official instances of works or anything like that. Too that you know, in many cases, it may be the the reason they're showing the results they are is that you know people want to click on um, uh, Amazon or something and order a print or something. Any number of those kinds of activities may be what they're going for. But I think it is this um, interesting challenge about how organizations sort of get themselves in front of their audiences when we don't have really any control over how you know a company like google is going to index our materials um mm -hmm. but the the other question that had come up um so do oh, the let systems... me interrupt oh, yeah. you because uh, i have yeah you're bashing google no you're not but uh <laughs> your warning about Google's uh, intentions or their uh, manner of working. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the really best uh, digital uh, picture of this painting is available at uh, Google uh, Arts and Culture. Oh, sure. So uh, they uh, have uh, digitized it and you can uh, print it really uh, house a uh, huge uh, copy of it if you wish to that no that's great and it is i think yeah. interesting to um i mean obviously the, the expansive access that we have to information and really a lot of the i mean so much of culture that we're trying to preserve now is collecting things from, from web organizations and sort of really creative innovative digital materials like that um but yeah it is interesting to see the ways that um Google and a number of other sort of big organizations have jumped in to enable and broaden access to digital information, but they're also in these, um, you know, they each have their own different business needs and cases. And so it's, uh, it's always challenging, but to jump to the question. So due to systems, migration, artificial intelligence, development, machine learning, we will now face new challenges in digital preservation. How do you see we should approach these challenges? So a few things that, uh, um, Machine learning, um, natural language processing. I think there's huge potential for these technologies to be deployed to enhance discoverability, searchability, usability of digital collections. So there's some really great advantages there. Um, I think at the same time, the proliferation of creative works through artificial intelligence um, is going to present some interesting new challenges for what to acquire or not to acquire to preserve of the sort of outputs of these things. Um, but I think in general, the, the biggest sort of suggestion and thought about how to approach any number of these sort of new and emerging technologies is to that it's first and foremost really important for libraries, archives, and museums to um, clearly have identified and stay true to their core values and principles. So whether it's things around privacy or whether it's, um, you know, sustainability, any number of the, the values that sort of in the United States, the Society of American Archivists has a set of values and um, uh, the American Library Association does too. Um, I'm, my guess is the same is true for many other um, library and information groups around the world. Um, but I do think the important point there is um, to not just get, sort of sucked into the future and, and new technologies and what they might do, but to sort of have a very deliberate approach that centers values and commitments to our users and communities um, first and foremost. Um, 
I think an example I'd give there too is that um, uh, NFTs as a very new technology has been something that a range of oral library and archive and museum organizations have dabbled in sort of selling copies, digital copies of works. I think there's um, some really good questions to be thinking through and parsing about the extent to which the uh, sort of model of how NFTs works um, is I think contrary to a lot of core principles in, in library, archive and museum uh, work and technologies. So I think that's an example of one where um, there will be new technologies that it's uh, uh, it might seem useful or fun or interesting to engage with, but that it would be better to, to really stick true to our values would likely avoid. Um, as uh, people are thinking and typing i will try to put up my uh, link to the record past recordings uh, and uh, there it goes i hope yes there it goes does it yes uh, okay hold on it's too fast for me. Does it work? Yes, I guess so. So uh, these are the seven uh, webinars that has already happened uh, during the course of this year. And uh, I am uh, putting up the uh, link to the website of the National Library of Poland uh, right now. I guess the link is quite easy and I'll put it in the chat uh, right now so that you can uh, get there easily. And uh, there it goes. So uh, the seventh webinar with uh, Trevor Owens is not there yet because we haven't finished yet, but we are about to close the meeting, I guess. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the recordings or learn something from the recordings. Uh, I hope uh, they might be useful. Of course, you can uh, contact uh, me with uh, questions, uh, suggestions, uh, whatever, and I could pass your question to Trevor or any other of the speakers, because they were all open to serving you with the knowledge. And uh, this will be it for the moment, I guess. Uh, there is another question or no, no question. There is a thank you. So thank you for uh, being with us. And uh, I hope to see you uh, probably next month, but the date is not fixed yet for another webinar where our guests will be uh, talking about metadata, which is my not favorite subject, but it has to be done. So uh, Trevor, thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure having you here or over there at your office really, but uh, meeting uh, across the ocean. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, the guests. And uh, well, come back to the uh, site with the recordings whenever you need them. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>